The Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. Welcome another Wednesday evening to Bible study. As we have always said, it is always so good for us to get together and go through uh, the Bible in Bible study together. And God be praised, we have been going a couple of weeks still in the book of Genesis and the book of beginnings, uh, looking at a number of different things to try to fit the pieces together and come to a greater understanding of some of the things that are uh, outlined in this wonderful book of beginnings. As we have said uh, over and over in the studies that we have done so far in the book, we must establish in our minds that this book is true, this book is authentic, this book is God-inspired. And in doing so, we establish within our own mindset that the worlds were made by the words of God. That mindset being there, it allows us to look through a particular lens as to how things that we are seeing now actually came about and therefore when we move to study and to try to fit the pieces together based on all the different things that we would have heard, we would have a context from which to expand our minds and expand our reasoning and expand our research and that context is always using as reference the word of almighty god that is the reference point that is the foundation stone that is where we established the fact as to how things that we now see uh, originally came about. Therefore, with this particular perspective, it gives us, amen, the ability and the wherewithal to look at and to examine all the things that we have been taught in the secular system as to where we came from and how we got here and why things are how they are, the humanistic view, the scientific perspective, and all the things that are out there. They are set up, they are geared towards uh, somehow shaking the very foundations of the faith of those who believe in God and believe in the God view that he made the heavens and the earth. And if we are not careful, as I have said uh, previously, we can easily go into the school system here in Jamaica, across the world, and feel intimidated by those that are non-Christians but who hold to certain humanistic views as to how we got here and why things are as they are. And in that intimidation, many walk away from the faith that they once held on to, that they once held firm. And before long, we find folks just moving and weakening and moving and ultimately walk away from God. As simple as it may sound, you would be surprised to know how many folks are shaken right now in their faith because of things that they hear over and over that the Bible and Christianity cannot be a real thing and the folks tend to give reasons as to why it cannot be real and why it cannot be true and they even go to the Bible to kind of pick out things that seemingly are inconsistent, things that seemingly or somehow contradict itself to show or to try to prove that the Bible is wrong and must not be taken seriously and it is essentially just a book of stories 
etc etc but we are here to hit back against those that fight against the word of almighty god to those that try to counter the truth of the things contained in the word of god and to allow us brothers and sisters beloved to seek to establish ourselves in our most holy faith to establish our confidence in the word of god which is contained in what we call the bible today and let no man move you let nothing that can come from a humanistic point of view shake your faith your faith must be rooted and grounded you must be firm in your confidence in the things that are contained in the book because they are true brothers and sisters they are real and they are relevant and none of us ought to be shaken to be moved in any way shape or form i stand this evening to remind us to stand solidly on the word of almighty god stand solidly on the things that are contained in the book the bible stand solidly on those things that are well established you are doing the right thing you are on good ground you are on solid ground and if you feel shaken in faith because of the constant bombardment by the humanists and the naturalists and the hate atheists and all if you're constantly bombarded take heed you're not alone but always cement this in your mind that the good book the bible you can count on it you can count on the contents you can trust in the words they absolutely represent the words of almighty god and i just wish to and feel like and i'm happy to say these few words as we start to build up and to hold you in your place to settle you in your faith in the word these are the words of almighty god and so i want you to be assured everything in the book is real every promise in the book belongs to you everything that starts out or ends with thus said the lord and even if the particular scripture does not say that i am submitting to you that the bible represents thus saith the lord and his words are yea and amen and you can count on it you can depend on it you can rest assured in these words and don't be soon easily shaken. Stand your ground. And before long, our Lord is going to be putting in his appearance. And you want to be sure that you are counted in the number when the saints go marching in. That is my prayer for all of us. And I pray that we do what we must and to, that we take all the steps and we order our steps in his word and we open up our hearts to allow him to have his way in our lives brothers and sisters we have been in the book of genesis and we have got we have gone through and we have up to last week we had reviewed a number of things and we by now should be clear in our minds that the things that are contained in the book they are true and even though there are those that would try to use scientific notions to discredit the word we are showing us that nothing that has come so far nothing that can come in the future can discredit the word of almighty god the words of god are the words of god and they stand sure as humankind we are mortal um, we are limited and 
God, I can imagine, is laughing us to scorn, laughing men to scorn who try to disprove his reality, who try to disprove and discredit and undermine his work, the handiworks of Almighty God. And he's standing in the heavens laughing at the audacity of humankind to try to prove that he doesn't exist. How can you prove that an existential God who is in existence all by himself, he, was, he had no beginning of days, he has no end of days. Uh, how can you prove that he doesn't exist? It cannot be proven because he exists. And those that are seriously serving him, those that are in the body of Jesus Christ can stand and testify and validate the reality and the authenticity of the Almighty God, our Creator. So if anybody is going to try to prove to you his non-existence, saints of God, you are going to have to tell them, I'm so sorry, but you are late because I already met him. And you just stand up and be strong in your most holy faith. We took time and we had shown that a lot of the things that they used to try to prove his non-existence, we actually showed us that indeed they were wrong because when they tried to say that there was no dinosaurs and there was no this and there was no that and the fossil says this and the scientific evidence and I say that in quotation, declares that this didn't happen and that didn't happen and there was no flood, etc., uh, etc. Et then there are other scientists, however, who in their studies and in their research and in their work have come to the conclusion that the things that were written in the book of Genesis did in fact happen. Archaeologists today have made uh, and found relics of the past. They have dug into the sand and gone back into the time and have found ancient cities and ancient places and ancient artifacts that in many instances the Bible itself made mention of. And when they uh, dug and did their research and found these places, their mouths opened in awe and bewilderment at the fact that the things that are written or were written from thousands of years ago in the Bible, many of them are being unearthed now and they are realizing that in fact and indeed the Bible is a book that can be trusted in terms of its historical accuracy and we don't need proof to accept that. We accept that by faith. But as we go through Genesis and we look at some things, we are showing to us to strengthen our faith and increase our resolve to walk with God because we are telling our mind, we are feeding into our own spirit, into our own conscious and subconsciousness that the things in the book are real and true. Amen. So when we met last time, we wanted to establish, because I believe it is important to establish the point that we all came from one ancestor. Once that is established and we are clear with that, as we start to move out to try to show us why the diversity in terms of different peoples at different places with different uh, skin colors and different hair textures and different eye colors and so forth. We want to establish first and foremost in our minds that even with the variation, even with the diversity, the fact is that we came from a common ancestor. And because I want to reiterate that fact, because if we don't accept that, then we are going to accept what the naturalists say that we evolved from inanimate objects that years ago exploded and over millions of years
came together to form the first human kind and then they mated and then life and intelligence came into them and i am not laughing at anybody but i'm just simply saying out of inanimate objects and a big explosion we then had life being formed over a million of years to the point where it just naturally automatically over time formed itself into human beings with brains and hearts and kidneys and livers functioning in such an intricate way food being taken in and passed into the bloodstream and that blood takes that food and carry it right across sweep across the muscles and in the muscles are contained the cells and flushes the cells with blood and the cells extract the food from the blood and then pass back the waste from the cells that are not used back into the bloodstream and the bloodstream carry those waste and through the kidneys they are disposed in, in our urine and other means and the system continues in an intricate manner time based and everything and all of that they say happened as a result of a chance occurrence when there was a big bang a big explosion millions and millions and millions of years ago and just by chance these things happened and they have said this as opposed to what we have presented based on what comes from the word of God that there was Adam and there was Eve our four parents and they came as a result of an intelligent being God Almighty himself making man from the dust of the earth making a woman from the side of the man putting them together getting them married and they started having children and those children have expanded themselves over the thousands of years across the length and breadth of the land mass that we call earth to the point where today we see what we have this is how the bible outlines it expresses it and presents it to us and i want us just to get back to scriptures to consolidate these points amen i want us to use the word to consolidate these points because as we step from this point onto the others it is going to be and we're going to do a little bit of as i said it might have been last week or the week before some basic genetics we're going to define what genetics is and then we are going to in very basic form just look at a few things to, so that we can understand the, the fundamentals of how uh, genetics work and how variations can come about, how the combination of different genes can cause uh, folks to look one way or look the other way, etc., etc. Or the, the combination of genes can cause a hair to be one way and another set of or another group of people there here is another way your eyes of a particular color and another grouping of people their eyes of a particular color we are going to take our time and we are going to look at it so as we go through we are going to do it and we have to do it pretty slowly because it has some science in it and not all of us are science based it has some simple things but because they are, as I said, they are scientific. It will take a little bit of time to grasp and to catch. So if you miss it as we go through in the presentation, you will have the opportunity to go back and to look at it and slowly, you know, listening so that we can catch it. But it gives us a, a kind of understanding as to how the things fit together and how we are where we are in the world today with some folks in Africa being dark skinned and short hair and some folks in um, the Americas and Europe they are light brown skin what we call white with you know longer hairs and so forth we are going to look at that and we are going to see that even though one parent and I must tell us our four parents our ancestors Adam and Eve they 
had to have a particular color. Were they white? Were they black? Were they in between? And whereas we cannot tell, we all would appreciate, especially if looking at the science, that they would have been probably somewhere in between because they would have had all the gene information right across and we will look at all of that. So we are going to take our time and we are going to go through and we are going to put some things to us, scientific things, simple things, but I believe all of us can grasp what we will put together and it will give us a good background, a basis to understand why there is the diversity, why there is the variation if we all came from one common ancestor and we will go through. But as I said, before we delve into that, before we move into that particular space, it is very important that we establish again. And so I just want to review, you know, by way of review, go back over to establish in our minds that the Bible, the Word, is, puts it in a particular perspective in terms of who our foreparents were. And I want us to use the scripture and rivet that in our mind. And I would want to use a particular slide. And so I've extracted a slide from what we had done last week just for review purposes for us to cement in our consciousness, cement in our mindset that we originate from Adam and Eve whom God made. Let nobody fool you. Let nobody try to twist that from your mind. You are children of the Most High God. You have a mind of your own. It is your faith that has taken you this far and you will continue to exercise faith in the Word of God. His word is yea and amen. They are true. And if God said this is how it happened, then you have no right to take anybody else's word to prove anything. If the word of God says so, then that is it. And that is what you're going to build yourself upon. So I just want us to review this slide with me. And we bring it up on the screen at this time. And you will notice that we are coming from a biblical perspective and the box there shows us uh, some scriptures. We see Adam and Eve and as I indicated before, they are our first parents. They are the, our ancestors. That is where we all came from. That is where we all shot out from. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 45 tells us, uh, and so it is written, the first man, Adam. There is no doubt in our minds, saints of God, that Adam was the first man. And this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Corinthians, and he was outlining uh, some doctrinal principles. But he, in bringing out those principles, uh, made mention to a fact in history that Adam was the first man. And so this is Bible. And so Adam and Eve, based on the slide that we were showing, was the first man and the first woman. And so Paul, in this writing, corroborates that. Now there is Genesis chapter number 3, and verse 20 and this scripture simply says and adam who was the first man based on what we just went through called his wife's name eve why did he call her eve because the word eve simply means the mother of all living and so he called her Eve because she was the mother of all living. So if there's the first man and he's Adam and the first woman, she is Eve. It means brothers and sisters simply that there were none before Adam in terms of humankind and there was none before Eve in terms of humankind. They were the first man 
and the first woman, they were our ancestors. So notice if this is so, then we have to accept that whether we are Africans by virtue of where we located after God dispersed the nations at the Tower of Babel, whether we are Africans, whether we are Europeans for all those who went to Europe, whether we are Asians for those that went and settled in Asia, wherever they went and settled and a nation group emerged, the fact still remains that going back in time, all our ancestors went back all the way to Adam and Eve. This is what the Bible have just said. And this is what we have to accept whether we want or not. This is Bible. And this is what we stand upon. So having said that, we wanted to expand a little bit because if there was Adam and Eve then, and nobody else, then it means that if there is going to be expansion, if there is going to be numbers of men and women going on and on till we, it reached a hundred, till it reached a thousand, till it reached a million, till it reached a billion, then there has to be sons and daughters born to Adam and Eve and they would then multiply and multiply and multiply and it is important. So the Bible told us in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 4 and the days of Adam after he had begotten set were 800 years and he begot sons and daughters. So I want us to understand now brothers and sisters that after Adam and Eve, the first man, the first woman, they were married and they got together and Adam knew Eve and she had Cain and Abel and then Cain killed Abel and then Seth came. But while all of that happened, certainly before and certainly after, they had children, sons and daughters. And of course, over time, this would have been a lot of sons and this would have been a lot of daughters. And this man lived for 900 and odd years. So as we said before, in that period of time, in that space of time, the countless amount of children and grandchildren that could have been there. And as children were born, men and ladies, then they started to get together and they reproduced. And they, brothers and other brothers and sisters, reproduced and they reproduced production rate as you know reproduction is exponential because you have two children each of those have two that means as you go down the line it's just going greater it's, it's an exponential expansion when children and children and children start to have their children it expands exponentially and so that was exactly what was happening there at the time of course we back to the slide we went on to say that god had visited mankind years down the line because they were evil and the imagination of their hearts was evil continually we had gone through that and it reached the point where god decided that he was going to bring judgment upon the earth because of how terrible men had become and when i say men i'm talking about male and female they became terrible every imagination of their heart was just continually constantly evil and god decided to put an end to that and he did and he caused the flood to come the bible said the fountain of the deep they were opened it said the windows of heaven they were opened and he caused a massive flood to come over the face of the earth. It was a worldwide flood. And even today, scientists are coming to the conclusion. Because, you know, there are many studies that science uh, undertake. And scientists will do something and come up with a particular finding. Another set of scientists will do the same thing. And they have a totally different finding. And there are those that today as we speak are convinced that there was a flood 
that engulfed the entire earth at some time in the past. They might not honestly want to link it to the biblical story with Adam and Eve and Noah building an ark. But the fact of the matter is, this is what the Bible's perspective, the Bible's, of, the Bible's account of the events were. And God sent judgment and the floods came and wiped out humanity except for Noah and his family. And so Genesis chapter 9 tells us about that, 17 to 19. Now we don't have to go through it. But then as we come further down to the people at the Tower of Babel, we find Genesis chapter 11, verses 8 to 9, tell, tells, tell, it tells us about it. And it gives us a story that they were all together and were building a tower in defiance of the word of Almighty God to spread out and to multiply because clearly it was God's intention for there to be nations across the earth. God had a plan. God was going to do something. And so Adam and Eve and then Cain and Abel and Seth and the other sons of daughter and it went down the sons and daughters and it went down the line, down the line until it reached Noah and Noah with his sons and his daughters and amongst others. And it reached to the point where only Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives, went in the ark along with two of every kind. And notice I said kind. Two of every animal kind. And they went into the ark and God destroyed them. And so having come out, they started to reproduce again and to repopulate the earth again. Noah um, might not have had any more children. According to scriptures, no more were there. So it was only the three of them, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But then Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they started to have children. And their children started to have children until the, until the numbers had grown exponentially. And they resided at a place over in the plains of Shinar, you know, called that place today Babylon. And over there in Shinar, there was a man that had taken up uh, dominance over them, a man by the name of Nimrod. And he caused the people to come together. Instead of spreading out and doing what was expected of people to do, to spread across and to take their place at different places across the earth, across the, the then known world, uh, they gathered themselves together and they were building a tower to reach up to God. No doubt this was in defiance of what God required. And they were defiant also because they saw what happened and heard what happened, I should say, with the flood. And probably determined that another flood, if that should come, will not catch them like that. So they were building this monument from earth going all the way up into heaven. Should a flood come again, they would be safe or they were building it for spiritual reasons because it is believed that this man Nimrod, um, wanted, he was the first to seek after a one world government. So that this plan for one man to take over the entire people of the earth. That's what Nimrod was doing then. And this is why God mashed it up for, for, for a number of reasons. He, did not, he was not interested in a, a one world government because the only person that can rule and run the world is Almighty God because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so Nimrod was seeking to be a Lord or God over the people and he was but a mortal man. Only God can be God over his people. So he gathered them together in one place. He would have had dominion and domination over them. God did not intend for that. And so ultimately he scattered them. But notice that the book of Acts, and I want us to read that together because the book of Acts also corroborates the perspective of the Bible. And Acts chapter 17 Brethren, beloved, and verse 26 tells us, and hath made of one blood, of one ancestry, of one race, which is Adam's race, one blood, all nations of men 
for her to dwell on the face of the earth. Brothers and sisters, I want us to take time and look at this scripture, look at this part of the scripture, what it is saying. He has made of one blood, and that is talking about Adam and Eve. And from them, all the nations of men came. But how is it? Because if the Chinese are Chinese, and the white folks are white folks, and the black people are black people, and you have Indians over there, how could we possibly come from one blood, one parents, one race? Well, the, if the Bible said it, even if we do not understand it, beloved, we have to accept it because it is the word of God. And some of the word of God cannot be, be true and others are a lie. The word of God is the word of God. We either totally accept it or we totally reject it. And it is as simple as that. And I am thankful to God that we have people who, even though they might not be able to put it together and to fully comprehend how it could have happened, they accept the fact that the word of God declare the particular position. And here the Lord is saying through the writer of Acts, Luke himself, and hath made of one blood, all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. So brothers and sisters, right across the length and breadth of the earth, where humankind is, we all came from one blood. Because this is how God had set the thing from the very beginning. So I wanted to just take the time out to establish that fact. Because that being established, even if we don't fully grasp everything that we are going to continue to go through, it is important that we stand solidly on the word of God. We stand solidly knowing that the book of Acts, which tells us about the birth of the church and what happened where the church is concerned, etc., etc., it is inspired. The book is inspired by God. God inspired the author to write the things that are con contained therein. So make no mistake about it. We came from one blood. Now the Bible tells us in the book of man, and this is just to cement this perspective. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 4. And it is important that we take the time and look at the scriptures because the scriptures really are the foundation and the fundamental of everything that we present to you one way or the other. So mark these scriptures and understand. So here it was now that they came to Jesus to ask him a particular question about marriage. But in answering them, he divulged things that we can easily extract for, from and corroborate what it is that we are saying right here. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning? So, brethren, beloved, the scripture is saying here to us that God made them at the beginning. And notice it says, made them male and female. We read the scriptures earlier in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45 to see who the male was. It was Adam and he was called by name by the Apostle Paul in his writing there. Then we went on to look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20 to see who the female was. And she was Eve and her name was called. And so Jesus, by virtue of his response, by virtue of his comments, he was validating that it was God that made Adam and Eve at the beginning. And that is something that we must hold, that we must accept, that we must recognize that Jesus himself is concurring that we came from Adam and Eve. Brothers and sisters, it don't matter what professor know it all says. Brothers and sisters, it don't matter what doctor think he know it all says. Jesus in Matthew 19 and verse 4 declared that he that made them from the beginning 
It was God that made us. It was God that put the man, the male, Adam, and the female together. And he did that at the beginning. It means then that what is being said in Acts chapter 17 and verse 26 is in keeping with exactly what Jesus said. Is in keeping with exactly what is written elsewhere in the Bible in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 45. It is keeping so that line upon line and precept upon precept we are seeing that God made Adam and Eve and they were our ancestors. Everything in terms of genealogy, brothers and sisters, point back to Adam and Eve. And that is very important. So this now takes me, this now takes me to a simple question that I would like to pose that I'd like to put to us and build the study so that we can slide right in to try to put the pieces together. If, and this is the question that I'm posing, if we all came from Adam and Eve, how is it that some of us have dark skin or light skin. My, my father's eyes are black. My mother's eyes are black. My eyes are brown. Now, you might not know that. If not that I tell you, you are going to probably pass and glimpse at me to look into my eyes to see if it is brown but they are brown and at a certain type of time of the day they are light brown at another time they are darker brown but they are brown but neither my mother nor my father has brown eyes but i have brown eye and I'm, eyes and i'm positive that who i say is my father is my father and i'm also positive that who i say is my mother is my mother I'm sure. And there are features that I have that they don't. I am much taller than my mother and I am much taller than my father. And as I said, my eyes are brown, theirs are black. Some variation so that although I came from mom and dad, common parents, I am different from them. Yet I have some of the traits that they have. I have a brother from the same dad and from the same mom. And I am a little lighter complexion in, in terms of on the scale. But I have a brother who is short. He's dark. And have features totally different from myself. But we all came from, and I'm positive about that also, the same father and the same mother and there are different features to us both in terms of our skin both in terms of our eyes in terms of our hair because the hair is light mine was was thick or much thicker than his and we were just different, though we came from the same parents. But, so that is just putting it in a mild way. But then we go further now, because we see folks of Asian orientation, like the Chinese or the Koreans, how and why do they look that way in comparison to those of us who were from Africa with our short, tough hair, and dark skin compared again to another set who are from Europe with their very light skin that we call white and their straight hair and their ears long and so forth. How could that have happened and why did that happen? And why is it that these what we call white folks live in these cold areas mainly and why is it that us 
black folks live in these hot areas mainly. And, you know, I just want to understand it, is the question that is being asked. And so we'll take a little time and we will go into it. But just to be clear, yes, there are diversities and there are diverse groups and there are differences in terms of our appearance, differences in terms of the texture of our ear, hair, sorry, and the colors in our eyes and the colors on our skin. And there are differences. There is no doubt about that. How do we account for that? And as we are about to segue into that, remember, there was always the question about Noah and the ark and the animals that went in. And remember, we made mention that God said two of every kind, right? And a kind, we did indicate, speak to a family of animals. A kind is referring to a, an entire group of animals and we want us to remember this. So kind is not species, whereas you can have uh, hundreds of species of a particular group of animal. You might, you will only have one kind. The kind represents the, the family group. So when we have, when we talk about dogs, though there might be, it is said that there is about 34 species of dog. There is about 338 breeds of dogs. You know, when you interbreed them and so forth, you have about... Most folks didn't know and don't know that there are dogs that are existing today that were never around at creation. They were never around at the beginning. So a dog like a pit bull that only came into existence a couple of decades ago when men take like a bulldog and cause them to mate with some other dog. It's like a combi, you know, when you combine a bulldog and a rottweiler, you get another breed and they have certain features. Well, a, a, what you call a pit bull is a combination of two dogs that they bred together and form the pit bull. These are dogs that they basically breed in labs and they came out and they work and, you know, they are a new breed of dogs and you have about 300 and odd breeds of dogs and about 34 different species of dogs but guess what all of these together comes under the family of dogs so when God said two of every kind he didn't he's not talking about two pit bull two German shepherd two doberman two you know dalmatian two poodle two, Poodles were never around at creation. Poodle is a lab animal that they take out genes and put together and form. So God wasn't saying two of each of these. And this is why people generally now have misgivings about the Genesis story because they say it's impossible for the ark to hold two of every species and every breed. God did not say that. It's the same thing, you know, we have to understand and if we don't understand the, the meaning of the terms and what they represent, we can leave with the wrong impression. So just like I said last week or the week before, when the Bible talks about the right hand of God, it's not a physical right hand like what a lot of people think. When the Bible say uh, Adam knew Eve, it's not that him getting to know more about her. It is a term that meant they came together and she conceived. Yes, we have to understand these terminologies. So when God said two of every kind, it was two of the dog kind. And the dog kind is one kind. Dogs. Two dogs. Two of the dogs that might have existed then. Not two German shepherds and two this and two that and two that. But most of those were not there. And so just two dogs had to come. Of the cat kind, it is the same thing. In fact, let me bring it up on the screen just to show us the first slide. And I just want us to see that um, and when we talk about the dog or the cat, it's the same thing as, as we go. So the dog kind is the 
family level we're talking about, you know, they call it Canada, Candy Day, and, and the chat kind they call filler day. And these are just the scientific terms that they use. So we talk about two kinds of dog or the dog kind. So it's just two dogs, not two of every species or two of every breed which you have today. Don't be fooled with that because the breeds came over time when naturally they started to interbreed and a new species came about or a new breed came about. Uh, that, that is quite natural, that occurs naturally. And as time goes on, you have new breeds, you have new species being formed. And none of these things have anything to do with evolution. These are just natural selection, natural occurring things. As you have a lot of dogs uh, uh, and, and they start to interbreed and they interbreed, you might have a new species, a new breed being formed and then they further breed and you have... So that is just normal. The same thing happened in the cat family. You have the cat kind. So when the Bible talks about two of every kind, two from the cat family, two from the dog family, etc., etc., two from the different families of animals. So that there would have been enough space, more than enough space on the ark to house two of every kind. And what we will see as we go further now, what we are seeing today represents mating with, within their kind and mating between this and that. And as they mate and they go to different places and mating continues, you, you find that different genes are passed to different dogs and till you have all kind of different uh, breeds later on occurring naturally. And of course, as humankind came about, kind came about, they too themselves assist the process and they breed different animals within the kind. And so, in fact, these days, they are now breeding different species because there was a time when you, 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 you just keep it within the particular group, lions with different lions. So you'd find that an Asian lion is bred with an African lion and it form a certain class of lion which they consider bigger, massive and that kind of thing. You would breed the African tigers with the Sengal tiger from India or with some others and they tend to breed the different tigers. But these days they're now breeding lion and tigers. And these things never normally happen naturally in the wild. Of course, in the wild, you do have some amount of that happening and you have different species coming about. Um, but even men today are interbreeding across the spectrum. And so a lion with a tiger, and I don't even know what they call it, but it's a new, so you might see this animal and say, my God, this animal was back there in the ark. No, they were not. These things happen over time and they, as it spread, you have new uh, breeds and species coming about. But this is not evolution. And so the evolutions will tell us that when there is a new species, it means that this has evolved and it came over years and over years until new... No, these things can happen in a matter of months, whatever time it takes for these animals to go through the cycle of reproduction and you then have a new breed or other species coming into being so it is important so the dog kind you have the cat kind you have all, and it is important that we have an understanding when the evolutionists say these are new species and therefore this is a sign that evolution happens this has nothing to do with evolution it's just naturally occurring our natural occurrences in the normal way of life in the animal kingdom. Like I said before, there are 34, about 34 species of dogs. But there is something I want us to understand. The secular world, this includes the scientists, this includes so many others. They tell us the scientists and, you know, all of those that are in the scientific arena that study these things, the biologists and all of those folks, they, they tell us something. They say that based on genetic, morphological and behavioral data, and don't be, 
Don't be intimidated by these big words. I'm just going to define them in a minute. But based on morphological and behavioral data, it is clear. And these are those that are in the area who have studied these things um, and literally corroborates with the word of God. So we know that we, we, we can work with it because we have established that the Bible is right and the Bible must be the reference point to everything else that man has to say. But these in the secular world have made this discovery and they are saying that based on genetic, morphological and behavioral data, it is clear that the domestic dog originates from the wolf. Now, most folks don't even know that a wolf is a part of the dog family. Wolf and coyote and, you know, the dingoes, all of those things that look like dog. And you, you, you hear they talk about years ago when you're in certain parts of the world and those shepherds and they wanted a kind of dog. They, they, they didn't have pit bulls at that time, but they used to use wolf or some dogs of, that look just like a wolf to watch over certain part of their property round and round. And when you look at the dog hundreds of years ago, it is almost like it's a wolf. Most folks do not know that the wolf is a part of the dog family. Yes, it is. So what is it that this statement is saying? This statement is simply saying, no, morphology right it says morphological and behavioral data what is morphology morphology is simply the study of the form or the shape or the structure of things whether it is a plant or an animal so that there are there are the doctors there are the scientists there are the biologists there are those in those arena who study genetics and they look at morphology and so that word morphological is from the word morphology and it is basically this the study of the form or the shape or the structure of an animal or of a plant so what they have done and this is how they were able to come to the conclusion that a wolf is in the dog family so it is the studies that they have done so these that are expert in that field have corroborated and have told us that wolf and coyote and all of those other that, that we wouldn't normally call dog, they are dogs. They are a part of the dog family. And so it is very interesting to know this. So they might look so different, but yet they are in the dog family. Now, look at that. That's, and you know, it's the best picture of a wolf for the time being that we could get. And from that wolf, from that kind of dog, through breeding and through genetics and so forth, it gave rise to what? Look at that set of dogs on the right. These are domesticated dogs. Their four parents was what you're seeing there on your left. The wolves, the coyotes, they're all a part of the dog family. So brothers and sisters, here is the point that I want us to note. Look to your left at that dog, which is called a wolf. Look how he looks. Look to your right and look at those set of dogs that are there that came from him. And when I say him, you know, a her would have had to be there. His sweetheart would have had to be there. And that wolf and his fiance, his wife, as they continue to mate and over time, look at what happened. You have different looking dogs, just like what you're seeing there. We want to, as we do this, we are going to do it with animals first. We are going to do this study. We are going to do like a genetics and we're coming to that. And we're going to start with animals. Because if you notice, the, the, the behavioral patterns are the same. It's easier to, to look at in terms of 
the fundamentals and then we move to apply it to humankind. But this is very striking and therefore we are showing it. Look at the wolf and then look at the dogs. They are in the same family and what you are seeing in terms of those number of dogs to your right all came, were coming down, they are descendants of that wolf that you see there. In fact, I'm going to show something even more striking. Look at the wolf and compare it with that poodle. These are the same species, brothers and sisters. Yet look how very different they look. How can that be? It is when we take our time and we go through and look at genetics, the study of genetics, we are going to see that you can have an animal right as you're seeing the wolf there and his descendants later down because of how they bred, because of gene pools that are there and which gene mated with, which were able to come together through mating with which gene, etc. You have offspring down the line that look totally different from you. We're not just talking about looking the same way in terms of feature, but then a shade here is different and a shade here of that is different. Look at these two dogs. They are almost totally, if not totally different, both in terms of how they look, in terms of their size, in terms of their makeup, Everything about them is different. Yet they are the same dog kind and they are the same species. Yet they are so different in their looks. And I wanted to present this to us for us to see how combination of genes can cause us to look so different down the line. And then when we start to match the snow, with some folks going to a particular location which is hot, others going to a particular location which is cold, and then they started, they, they were looking different already, and those that looked the same way got together and went over one particular part of the face of the earth. Those that look another way, but they all look comparable, they banded themselves together and they went to another location. You would be surprised how we end up with folks looking different, being in different places, but we're not going to jump the gun. We're taking it a step at a time. So I just gave us that as a teaser. But the fact is, you can start a particular way and look down the line a totally different way after years of mating, sharing of genes, pooling of genes, different genes coming together, and you have a totally different look over time. And so what happens genetically is that there is a loss of information that results in the different looks and features. And I will explain that as we go on. So it is important. So just look again. This is the dog kind. And you have the wolf. You have the coyote. You have the African wild. What is happening here, you know, as they meet... You have genes being lost, genes being lost, and as you lose some genes, those genes that are recessive, that are lower, in the, the, if they come together, you get another lower gene. You, in other words, there are information that gets lost over time, and it results in a different looking animal but they are of the same kind, they are of the same species because they are dogs, but they tend to look different. And as we look at this picture coming down, starting with the wolf, which has all of the genetic information there, but then as you come down and as you go down over time, notice that they look different and dif different and different, coming all the way back down to the poodle, who is still a dog. But look at the difference in their looks. All looking different. But they are still dogs. What causes that difference in look? Even though they are dogs. Brothers and sisters, we will discuss that. And if you see a poodle and a collie 
or if you see a bulldog and an African wild dog, you might leave with the impression that they are both not dogs. But they are. And you might think that, you might move to say, oh my God, evolution caused one to evolve this way over millions of years and one to evolve that way over millions of no evolution at all absolutely not it is from the same wolf who is in the dog family that you can end up with a bulldog a collie a poodle depending on how and who mates with who and what gene pool is brought into the entire group when mating is taking place. And we will show you that. So we are going through with the animals so that you can understand and you can see what is happening here. This is one family of dogs. And look at what we are seeing. Because of genetics. And this is why I, I am saying to us, we are going to have to take a simple look at genetics right so new species we see are formed but new species have nothing to do brothers and sisters with evolution 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 requires new information being added to the genes now all of these dogs that we're seeing looking different no new gene no new information sorry is being added to the gene in fact what is happening it is that information is being lost in other words, as the animals start to look different, the difference that you're seeing there is as a result of information being lost. And I'm going to show you how easily information can be lost as mating takes place. And there's a wide gene pool, you know, in the, the whole DNA, you'll see how easily information is lost. But the point is, evolution tells us that new information is added to the gene over millions of years. What we are seeing in these animals, and we will see ultimately in humankind, is that no new information is added. If there is anything that is happening within the gene pool, is that information is being lost. So that this has nothing to do with evolution. Our looking different has nothing to do with evolution. The animals looking different has nothing to do with evolution. It has to do with how the genes get together and cause the difference in appearance. There's a variety, a diversity in terms of genes and the information that is contained in them. Now, I did indicate last week that we are going to delve a little bit into genetics. And we certainly can't go deep into genetics because it is a very specialized area. It is highly technical. And you know, you have to be in the science field to get into all the details and so forth. But like anything else, um, you can and we can all get a fundamental concept of what is happening so that we can with this basic concept apply it to come to a better understanding to come to a, a reasonable understanding so that we can understand what is at work and how things work right genetics is what causes us to look different genetics and our genes and you would have heard people talking about our genes you got this gene from your father or you got this so if you look at many individuals you hear they say he has the father's eyes but the mother's nose that's genetics because when they come together a part of the mother and a part of the father is fused between the sperm of the man and the egg of the female so that when that baby that new life that new personality comes there is a mixture part of mom and part of dad but there can be cases where all of dad and none of mom, mom or little of mom the dominant ones come from dad or there can be cases where the dominant one comes from man not a thing for him father everything is for the mother and many times folks leave and say i am not going to accept this child 
This is not my child. We were discussing it earlier. This has to be a jacket because not one thing from... So folks leave believing that the child is not theirs when they start to see the child forming out and coming up and not one thing for the father, everything for the mother to the extent that, you know, folks have to say, you know, say it's not the father that because all they have everything for the mother. They might see a feature that is not for the mother but it is also not on the father. And so they said, the father, this is not his father. This lady did some hanky-panky, and it might not be so any at all. And so we have to understand how genes work so that the baby that emerged as a result of a union can have... In fact, there are children that are born that does not look either like mother or father. They might have dominant, um, recessive, the smaller genes for both mother and father. And there's a dominant gene that was there that was with grandfather. And when you look at this boy, he is a dead stamp of his grandfather. But not, don't look like him father. And don't look much like the mother. And folks say, oh wow, you might see two short or one parent at an average height and another one at the same average height, five feet. Five, five feet six, and yet they have a daughter that she is tall. Or you might say everybody else have a particular height, and one, you know, you have four children, and everybody is a certain height, and then one just come and him taller than everybody. And you say, Oh, him so tall. It might not be dad, but it might be mom. Sorry, it might not be dad, it might not be mom, but it might be his grandparents. So mom is short, dad is short, and here comes the son. We appear so taller than everybody else, and the mother short and the father short. He has information in his genes that cause him to be there. And even though it might not be dominant in his dad, dominant in his mother, but they are short it becomes dominant in him and he now stretches over them and folks wonder so this is why we want to get a basic understanding brothers and sisters of genetics what it is how it works and how it can be applied for us to get a better understanding as to why there can be diversity in terms of the offsprings and yet it is one common appearance. Amen? So that is what we are looking at. And that is what we are going to be transitioning into for us to understand. So we can appreciate more when the Bible outlines that it is one common ancestor, Adam and Eve. And therefore, even though the children look different, we can understand and appreciate and therefore don't accept it with our minds but our heart is telling us that is evolution because it couldn't be yes i hear the bible said that but something must be wrong because look at the people over there and look at the people over here we are so different we are poles apart in terms of how we look and so some evolutionary process must take place man something is into something no the bible is not wrong never wrong and so adam and eve is the four parents and our ancestor, our common ancestor, we will take the time and we will see just by a simple look and study and understanding of the basics of genetics, we will then be able to apply it and to see how it can happen and then come to embrace Genesis even more. So let's look back at the slide now and we can easily um, present to us what genetics is. Genetics Simply put, it's a branch of biology that deals with the heredity and the variation of organisms, right? So, it's, so that's just a simple definition, a branch of biology that deals with the heredity and variation of organisms. So uh, let us talk about animals, for example. Uh, looking, when you talk about genetics, you are looking at how um, 
they vary one from the other as a result of the genes that is passed down to children from parents. And when you talk about heredity, that is what it is talking about, what they received from their parents in terms of genes, in terms of the information that will determine what their skin color, what shade of brown they will be, or what the color of their eye will be, or what they, it, you, know, you understand? So as we look at genetics, these are the things that will come to us, and it is important that we have this basic information. Now, our genes carry information that gets passed down, brothers and sisters, from one generation to the next. So this is what is carried in, you know, the information about the next generation. What is in it? Um, talk about your height. It's right there in the genes. Talk about the color, the shade of your skin. It's right there in the genes. Talk about the texture of your ear. It's right there in the genes. And our gene carry information. That's, that's that vehicle that carry the information. And it gets passed from one generation to the, the next. Um, and it is important for us to, to appreciate that. So in other words, the traits that people and animals inherit from their family comes via their genes, their DNA, and it is important that we see that. So that's why we want to take a, a, a little look at the whole concept of genetics so that we can appreciate that the genes carry the information from one generation to the other. And as we learn a little bit more about the genes themselves, we are going to see that as they combine, because the father and the mother, the parents, they themselves have genes. You have the male genes, you have the female genes. And when you two of them come together so that a new child comes, you are going to find that the genes that both of the, them have, they can be combined in the child. And the combination can be in a number of different ways. So as we look and take our little, you know, basic study of genetics, we will see how these things can happen. Now, in genetics, there is a convention that is used, something that is an accepted norm so that we can understand as we study. In genetics, we label genes with letters. So you will see the letter A or B or C, and then you will see one of them is a capital A and one is a common A. Look at, look at the screen. One is a capital B, one is a common B. The one is a capital C, one is a common C. So this is typically in doing the study of genetics, they label the genes using alphabets, letters that we know. When you see the capital letter, it represents the gene that is dominant. And when you see the common letter, like the common A and the common B and the common C, they represent the genes that is recessive or not the dominant one, all right? So everybody have a dominant gene um, in terms of the parents, let us say you have a dominant gene and you don't must have to have a dominant gene. You can have all recessive genes and we will talk about that. But for now, we're starting out, we want us to understand that the genes are labeled with letters and then the capital letters represent the dominant gene and the common letter represent the recessive genes are the one that is not dominant all right so i said it earlier and i just want to reiterate it we will treat with genetics in the animals we do them in animals first and then apply the basic principles to human as, as simply because the basic principles are the same it's just that in in applying it to animals it makes the study a little easier and we want to be as simple as we possibly can just so that we can capture all of our brethren as we make the presentation and do the study all right so pretty much that is what is happening now in humans there are about 25,000 
to 30,000 genes, amen, that, that, that is in all of us. So as simple as we look as a, a, a basic male and a basic female, all of us, we carry genes, right? It is a part of the makeup of humans. If you don't have genes, you are not a human. You are not here. If you are here and you are hearing me right now, hello, one, two, three, if you heard that, you're a human. You're a man or you're a woman. So you're hearing me. It means that you have genes. It is, that is why you look the way that you look. That is why you are the way that you are. The genes have information that makes you who you are, how you sound, how you look, etc., etc., etc. Now, in humans, each of us have about 25 to 30,000 genes. And as a result of that, there can be a whole lot of combination of genes that can ultimately determine who your offspring will be, how they will look, uh, how they will... Uh, uh, who they will resemble, what kind of feature they will have in terms of their eyes, uh, what kind of feature they will have in terms of their nose and their ears, etc., etc. There is a big pool that you can pull from in terms of the combination of genes, the fact that each of us have so many genes. And I will explain this a little bit further. In fact, let me jump to another slide and then come back to this one. Let me jump to the next slide just to make the point that I want to make. Now, we, we started out and, and said that everyone has genes. When we gave the definition of genetics, we, and we spoke of the convention that guides the study of genetics, we say that the genes are represented as letters. And then these letters, you have a capital letter and you have a common letter. And the capital letter represents the dominant gene and the common letter represents the gene that is not dominant. They call it recessive. So follow that now. So that means that let us look at what we have here. And let us assume that two persons are coming together right to form a new child so mom has her and if we slip back to the slide before that you're going to see so i just say that if you slip back you look at the male you see below you see male and beside it you see female so the male have his genes which is represented by and this is the husband capital a and common a capital b and common b capital c and come and see. So that's daddy. And those are the genes that he has as a man. Beside him, there is the female, which is his wife. And she has her sets of genes represented by A, B, C in capital and also A, B, C in common. So each of them have, has dominant genes and each of them has non-dominant or what you call recessive genes. Now when they get married and they come together and to have children, they are going to produce, and this is shown now on the next slide, they are going to produce a child. Look at the bottom. You see a little blue slab, right? And that is the offspring, let us say the first child that they have. Now, that child comes out of a possible combination of offspring. Look at the box above the child, where you see big A at the top, two capital A's, two capital B's with the, yes, at the top, two capital A's, and then go across two capital B's, and go across two capital C's. That is a combination. So he has, that child can have the capital A from his daddy and the capital A from his mommy. He could have the capital B from daddy 
and the capital B from mommy. Or they could have the capital B from C from daddy and the capital C from mommy. That is a possible combination of the offspring. All right? Another possible combination, look below it, are two common A's, two common B's, or two common C's. We're just looking at all the, or some of the possibilities from just three genes, or six genes. A, big A, little A, big B, little B, and big C, little C. So you could have one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, three, five, fifteen combinations are here. From just mom and dad with that little gene of big A and little A, big B and little B, big C and little C coming together. When the eggs are fertilized, you can have all of these, any one of these combinations. So this child in the blue at the bottom that came about as a result of mommy and daddy having their first child, you, can you look and see, brothers and sisters, what is the combination? Big A, big A, big B, big B, and big C, big C. That child has a combination. But look what has happened. They totally left out the little A's. Now, that is a set of information that the parents had that that child now does not have. I wonder if we see that. That individual that is there, look at what his gene pool is. Big A, big B. Big A, sorry, big A, big A. Big B, big B. Big C, big C. And what I call big C you know, is a capital C. So it has capital A, capital A. Capital B, capital B. And capital C. And we're just running the curse on it. And capital C. So that's a new individual. That is a child. But look at the genes that he inherited from his parents. We notice that. But we also notice, and if we go to the next slide, we will see it. I'll make mention of it a little clearer. Notice that the individual looks, will look totally different from the parents. But also notice that all the information that the child had came from the parents. But actually, it has less information because there is no common A in that child, no common B in that child, and no common C in that child. And that's very important that we understand what I have just said. Very important. So I'm going to, I'm going to come off the, the slides and just allow us, just allow me to make the point again. Allow me to make that point again. So notice that child could have a number of different gene profiles, a number of different genes in his pool but this child out of the 15 or more combinations that could be there the, the genes that this youngster inherited from his or her parents is just the capital A genes the capital B's and the capital C's and that is very, very significant. So although they are not looking exactly like the parent, this child is not looking exactly like the parent. The child, however, has all the information in him coming from the parents. So he's going to look a particular way. Let us now assume that that couple had another child. And that child now had all of the common A, the common B's, and the common C's. You're going to have a totally different child looking totally different from his brother or sister and also looking different from his mother and father. He would have had information that he received from the parents, but then 
he would have had only common genes, common letter genes, the recessive genes. So something is happening here now. Two different child, two children from the parents, but they are looking different. One with just capital letters representing their genes, and the other child with just common letters representing their genes. But let us go back in the slide. I'm going to jump back at the slide now. And I want us to remember that there is a chart there that shows you from just the A, capital A, common A, the capital B, common B, and the capital C, common C. There's, I'm, I'm going to jump to the chart. Sorry, it's not time for the chart yet. I'm going to jump back at the chart. But I just wanted to make the point. From the, from the chart that we looked at, there was a little box there and it showed us and we will go to it very shortly. So I just want to refresh our minds. That mother with the capital A and the common A gene, the capital B and the common B gene, the capital C and the common C gene, when she mates with daddy who has his set of genes also, which is capital A and common A, capital B and common B, capital C and common C, when those genes are combined, they can be combined in a number of ways, adding up to about 15. And we showed it in the box. I, I, let me bring back up that screen. Uh, we go back about two slides and we will see that little box that shows us what the combination will look like with A, and, and that's the screen, we're going to bring it up now because it's going to show you. So once they meet, you're going to see the possible combination of their offspring. Now, if we put the cursor at the top, that's the one with the capital A's. That's the one, right? And the capital B and the capital C, good. That's the one that we have, capital C, right? That's the one that we showed us at the bottom. That's the child, that's the first child of that the parents had. See that right there in blue there down the bottom. So that's the first child. And that child received all of that genetic information from the parents. However, if they had another child, which we just indicated that they did, and that child now could have another set the two, they could have two common A's, two common B's, and two common C's. And they inherit that set of genes from their parents. Because remember now, look above it, the parents have big capital A and common A, capital B and common B. See them in color at the top there, capital C and common C. So they can receive anything there that the parents have all right so let us say the parents have another child the third child they could inherit a different set of genes now look at that one now here is one with a capital a and a common a and then capital b and common b and then capital c and come and see, ah, this child now could look like mom or dad, dead stamp, because they have both the big A and the little A, the big B and the little B, and the big C and the little C. If the big A was daddy's big A, and the big B was daddy's big B, and the big C was daddy's big C, that child going to be the dead stamp of daddy. But then I'm going to have the little A from mom and the little B from mom and the little C from mom in terms of the genes. So you're going to see some of mom traits in that one too. But the dead, you hear them say, the splitted image of his father. That will be the third child. But then that could be, let us say, the parents of another child. Remember now we're talking about Jamaican parents, so we have enough children. So don't feel that like these parents are having too much children with Jamaica we are in, right? So let us say the fourth child now, but hold on, notice now that this child have big A, little A, 
as a combination. But oh, notice, you know, big B, big B. And then a big C and a little C. Totally different combination. Now, this child is going to look different from his brother. Is going to look different from his other brother or sister. Is going to look different from the other one. Because why? The gene combination is different. And of course, they could have another child and have a big A, little A. But the next one is a big B and a little B. And then they could have, the other gene would be big C and big C. You see how the genes can be mixed up? And as they are mixed up because there's a pool, you can combine them in so many different ways. Now, this is how we have individuals looking different, being different. And all of them are coming from one parent, one mom, one mom, one dad. But depending on which gene from the pool is passed on to the child, they are going to have a different texture of their skin because these big A and little A and big B and little E could represent skin color. They could represent eye color. There are information in the gene that is passed down. They could represent which one have long ear and which one have short ear. Now I say this to make a simple point. And, and, and I, I say this so that we can understand. My father is from a family. It's about probably 10 of them in his family. Now, of the 10 children that were born to his parents, only three of them were dark-skinned. All the others were light-skinned. So out of ten, three were dark, and everybody else were light-skinned. No, the light-skinned ones, especially the girls, all had long hair that reached them beyond them, their shoulders. Long hair, long ear as if they are, and it reached them there. But one of the dark ones was a lady, right? Two of the boys were dark and one of the girls and the dark girl she had her hair going way below her bottom same mom same dad seven of them and when i say brown skin i'm not talking i don't know if you would call me brown i will be probably dark or whatever but their complexion what you call brown was what we would say, them red, light brown. That's my father's sisters, except one. And their hair were long. But then one of the dark ones was a girl. And her hair, that's the dark one, was exceptionally long. Went, as I said, way below her bottom. Very long. It was as if she's an Indian long here and yet they came from one daddy and one mommy the gene pool is so big you would be surprised so if over time you will be surprised of what can happen now let us say that that screen that we looked at a while ago and we saw that that second child which had all common letters making up is or her gene and let us say this is at the beginning when it was adam and eve we could call that parents adam and eve let us say a couple of the children they had a couple of sons and daughters as genesis chapter 5 and verse 4 told us sons and daughters and let us say one of the sons with all common letters kept common A, common A, common B, common B, common C, common C. Let us say that child down the line gets married and gets a wife. Remember, no, no, these are 
brothers and sisters, because it was permissible then. It was allowed then, it was permissible then. That is how reproduction took place, because it was only Adam and Eve. It is only their children that would be there. A man couldn't say, I'm going to Africa to get a girl, because no, Africa was there. Nobody else wasn't there. It was just Adam and Eve's offspring. So when they had enough children, um, a brother would marry to a sister. Now let us say the brother had all common A, common B, and common C gene. He would have lost some information that the parents had because they had common A, but they also had capital A. But the son, all he has now is pure common A, no capital A. So some information that the parents had, he doesn't have because he has no capital A genes, just pure common A genes. Mark that. Let us say he gets one of his sisters to wife. And she has only common A genes also. And they get together. She would have lost some information too that parents had because they had capital A. She has none. Suppose he, with all of his common A's, married to her with all their common A's. When they have children, they are going to have children with only a certain gene pool now to work with. Because the capital A's are not in their gene pool. So every time that they have children, their children are going to look pretty much like them. So if they had a certain type of ear, those children will have the same kind of ear going down the line because the genes that they have is just for that kind of information. Remember now, daddy had the A gene, capital, and the A gene, common, and the B, capital, and the B, common, and the C, capital, and the C, common, and mommy had the same. But this particular offspring, because of the combination that is there, it could be any of 15 combinations that we looked at a while ago, except that this boy as periodic common A's. And let us say he gets a wife and she has only common A's and they get together. Their offspring is only going to have mom common A, dad common A with the information. Now there might be other information in there, but it's just pure common A genes. So going down the line, those children are going to look alike. Let us say now that the first child who had capital A Capital A, capital B, capital B, capital C, capital C. Let us say he gets a wife who has all capital genes also and they get married and they have children. But once he gets a wife, that means they're married. So they're married and have children. Those children are going to have genes with just capital A alone because they have to get the gene from parents. So they're going to get just the capital A genes alone. So when they have children, they are going to look pretty much like them. Whatever it is that they have, let us say they have short hair, the common G1, the common A, B, C, they can have short hair, the capital A, B, C, they can have long hair because those genes can represent a whole lot. So their children coming below them going to have pure capital A genes. And the one with the common A, their children are going to have pure common A genes. But then remember, he had other children, they had other children also. And some of them had capital A mix up A, B. Then the other one with capital B, common B. Then the other one, common C. Cap and you have a number of different combinations and they start to have children too. Those with more capital A, when you look a particular way, those with more common A's and then capital, based on the mixture, the people tends to look different. Now, I say all of that using a simple ABC, which gives you, you know, a combination of about 15. What if I was to tell you that with 25 to 30,000 genes in all human beings, when a man and a woman come together, each having 30,000 genes, 
and that mesh together. You know what the combination would be like in terms of numbers? Billions. So that you can have so much different combination in the gene pool that clearly some way have textures of light skin, textures of dark skin, textures of this. So depending on who married to who, you could, even though they come from the same general ancestry, you are going to find that some have pigmentation differently because the gene pool is so big and the combination is so vast that although your grandfather was a certain of certain coloration, grandchildren can be of a different because in the gene pool which God at the beginning placed inside of Adam and Eve. So God placed the genetic information in our initial four parents right at the start. And he placed in them that 25 to 30,000 genes that will give you a combination adding up into millions. And therefore, the more children come, is the more different genes were mix up together. And it is in the mixing of the genes that it gives you what a particular skin color, a particular eye color, a particular hair texture, a particular whatever is going to be like. So I have jumped the gun, but since we were on that track, I said, let me just flow into that so i'm going to go back now at the slide and then take us through systematically so that we can follow but because i was on that train it was important for us to go down that line so we have done this slide already and we understand where we were in relation in relation to the combination the possible of combination of genes and you know Therefore, the offspring that would emerge as a result of that. We did make the point that individuals will look different from the parents because of how the genes um, that they receive uh, come to them. But that notice that all the information that they have though came from the parents. So as in the case with one of them, the, the, the first child, for example, he has all capital letter genes. And we see it because the common letters were, were not passed on to him. Now, do you know how many atoms there are in the universe? And I'm asking this question, why? Why am I asking this question? I'm asking this question for us to see and to appreciate how vast the number is going to be when we look at the amount of possible combination of genes we can have that can give us the color of our eyes or the texture of our hair or the color of our skin or the shape of our nose or how our eyes are set. You ever notice how some cultures or some tribes or some people, their eyes, like the Chinese, their eyes set a certain way. And at the same time, if you look at Caucasians, their eyes look different. You ever notice how as those, our four parents that went to over to Africa, you ever notice how their nose big and flat, right? That is why look at many of our noses now, and yes, you, you know, our noses generally are big and they're generally flat. If you notice, if you look at the nose of folks who are of Caucasian um, descent, their noses tend to be narrow and straight and it is not flat and spread out. It's kind of straight and off the face and all of those things are in the gene pool. So I ask this question first for us to kind of gauge the size to get the immensity of what I'm talking about. Now, do you know how many atoms there are in the universe? And I answer the question. It is estimated that there are about 10 to the 80th power. That is 10 with the number 80 at the top of it. You know, like you have 2 squared, 2 with 2 at the top. 2 times 2 give you 4. This is 10 with 80 at the top. So that when you work it out, you have 10 with 80 zeros behind it. So that move from that you're talking about millions and billions and in other words you can't imagine that number it is billions this is a number bigger than billions it is zillions the number is just massive just imagine 10 with 80 zeros behind it we, i don't think they they have a 
Because you have millions, then you have billions, then you have trillions, then you have, I don't know what you would call that. But that is showing you 10 to the 80th power. In other words, 10 and 80 is at the top. For those who would understand the term, like you would say 10 squared, 10 to the second power, which is 10 times 10 is 100. This is 10 to the 80th power, 10 with 80 at the top. It's, it's, it's 80 zeros is a massive amount of zeros. And that's a large number. You cannot imagine that number. So think about 10 to the 80th, right? Right, it's written, represented like that. So that is how much atoms there are in the universe, the known universe. Right? The known universe, 10 to the 80th power. It's a big number. All right. So having said that now, let me ask another question. Do you know how much information is in our genes right now? If one man and one woman get together right now, do you know how much information, how much possible combination of genes there are? This is approximately 10 to the 2017 power. Remember you know, how much atoms in the known universe is 10 to the 80. How much information is in our genes right now? One man and one woman come together. When you put those 30,000 genes that is in the man and 30,000 genes that is in the woman and combine them when they get together and an egg is formed, you know how much information is in that genes in terms of the combination of genes? 10 to the 2017 power. Far more atoms that are in that are in the universe. It is mind boggling. In other words, you know how many children you could have without any two of them that have the same combination of genes. So that if a man and a woman come together and have a hundred children, those hundred children could have a total of it's, it's the, the number is just mass in other words those hundred children could be so different because the amount of genes that are out there that the combination that could make up each child is so mind-boggling in terms of number it's not like 15 with the A, B, and C that we used a while ago, yes, the 15 combination. This is 10 to the 2017. This is trillions, zillions, quatsch. In other words, it is almost an innumerable number in terms of what the gene combination could be. And evidently, it is God that placed all the information in the gene because he determined from the beginning that there were going to be nations and that the nations would have been different. God placed it inside of the genes and when it is pulled together they, Adam and Eve had children, their children had children, their children had children and because the pool was so vast you had children that some were light skinned, some were dark skinned even though they came from the same parents, the information was put in the genes by Almighty God. So in some genes, there were genes that had dark skin, lighter skin, much lighter skin, and what we call white, what you call black, because they really know white people are black people. If you want to know what white is, I'll show you. But there is a variation in terms of the shades of brown that God placed in different genes. Remember, no, no, there are billions and zillions of genes with information in them about who we have dark color, light color, class eye, eyes that are big, eyes that are small, straight nose, flat nose. It is all contained in the genes. The information is in the genes. So based on who mate with who from way back when, you're going to have some of these genes coming out and others going to this set of family here and others going to that set. It was all contained, brothers and sisters, in the genes. And because the number is so vast, there is a vast amount to choose from. So the point I am making, brothers and sisters, is that God put that kind 
of genetic diversity in the dog kind, the elephant kind, the cat kind. And that's why you find that dogs, um, even from back then, when they, were, they looked different, they had different... The, the genes were already placed there from the beginning. The cats look different. The genes were already there from the beginning. And it is the same thing in humankind. So you have different looking cats. You have different looking dogs. You have different looking elephants in terms of after their kind. And the same thing with the humankind. The variety. The diversity is there so that within humankind, there is that large genetic diversity and we will look different. Notice that where the dogs are concerned, they all had four legs. They all had two ears. They all made barking kind of sounds. Notice with the cats, they all had four legs. They all had tails. They all made sounds, whether it is a meow or, a, or a whatever the sound is at the time, or a roaring sound. They all make sound. It is the same thing with human beings. We all have two legs. We all have two hands. Do you note that the black man is as brilliant as what we call the white man? Do you know that the Indian is just as brilliant as the man that is considered white or considered black? Do you know, brothers and sisters, that we have black people, and I use the word black in quotation, that are recipients of scholarships to study overseas? Do you know or did you know that Dr. David Panton was a Rhodes Scholar? Did you know that one of our members of parliament, Ronald Twits, was a Rhodes Scholar? Do we know that one of our current politicians, who is the Minister of Justice, was a Rhodes Scholar? These are all, well, he is of Chinese descent, but he was, he's a, was a Rhodes Scholar. Dr. David Panton is of black descent. He's a Rhodes Scholar, a former president of the United States of America, Bill Clinton. He was a recipient of Rhodes Scholarship. What is the point I'm making? We all have things in common. Two legs, two feet, two hands, sorry, two ears, one heart. One brain, the only thing that separates us, that causes us to be different, we have the same intellectual capacity. There was a time when folks thought that people who were of color, I say black in quotes, didn't have the same mental capacity as folks who were supposedly white. We have seen that that is not so. Mental capabilities and potential, same same. The, the abilities, same. The only difference in people that are Indian, Chinese, Caucasian, blacks, and I'm just using the term because these are the terms that we understand, is the color of their skin and the texture of their hair. And that comes about as a result of genetic diversity. So, I keep jumping the gun, but when I'm at a point that will allow you to appreciate the statement, I go into the statement. But it is as a result of the genetic diversity, but it is the same human kind, and it is the same traits that came from our common ancestors, the same ability to think, the same ability to reason, the same ab so that if you look, they used to say that the the, the, the highest position in this world was the presidency of the United States of America. But white men have sat into it, and I say white in quotes, and so have black men. Because the potential, the abilities, the, they are all there. They came from our common ancestors. So as we go through further, we will show you more how it happened but we would have gotten the gist and would have been clear on that 
but it is just genetic diversity that would have caused things like the nose and the color of the skin and the ear texture. But there is more. We have to stop now because I think I'm on to two hours and we have to stop. But we pick up again next week as we delve a little bit deeper and spread a little bit more into the concept of genetics and understanding how we are, who we are. Because there is more, you know. There is the Tower of Babel and there is God separating the people by languages. And possibly those who knew each other, those who looked alike, those who spoke the same language, they all came together and they went go to one point. They might, a set might have gone who could be sustained in the cold areas. They went to the cold areas and who died, died and who live, live. Another set would have, if they went to Africa, that part of Africa was hot and they dwelt there. And then if folks were there who couldn't survive, they died out. And who remained, that formed that group of people that eventually became a particular nation. We're going to go into that and we're going to show you how the diversity, how the splitting, how the breaking, how the going to different. It is all there in the Bible and it is no rocket science and it did not happen by chance. And the Bible makes it clear how they were split, how they were separated and how different groups of people went to different parts. According to Acts 17, they spread across the face of the earth. I have to stop here now. Uh, when we meet again, God's willing, next week, we, as I said, spread a little bit more out into the basic study and understanding the concept of genetics so that we can see some more and appreciate how and why things are as they look now. But understanding that it does not take away from the fact, because we look different, that we would have come from one common ancestor. So we're going to go a bit more and we're going to drill into it and we will get to appreciate. So don't be troubled by the, 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 the whole genetics and the technical things that I'm talking. It's very simple. And you just want to look at it one or two times and you will realize that it is simple and I'm doing everything to keep it as simple as possible. But I know without the background in science, it might be a, but no, very simple. And that's why we're keeping it to the basics. When we meet up again, God's willing, next week, we look some more and we try to present it so that we can understand. But at the end of the day, we are showing that coming from one parents doesn't mean we cannot look differently. And we are showing that with things that we know factually, scientifically, medically, and it corroborates and tie in with the scripture, which is our reference at all times. We must stop here. Let us bow our heads and pray. Father, we bless your great name. We thank you again, mighty God, for allowing us to sit together in Bible studies one more evening. I pray and I ask you, O God, that you will open our minds and help us to absorb the things that we are looking at. Help us to see for what it is worth. Help us to put it together. And for this, we become better Christians, recognizing more and more, and as we drill into the Word, that the Word of God is indeed true and trustworthy. Plant your Word in our hearts. Help us to study. Help us to review. Help us not to come Wednesday after Wednesday just to take it for what is presented each Wednesday, but to put it together. Go over the notes so that we will appreciate and love your words. Bless your people. Bless us together. We are your children and the sheep of your pasture. Have your own way. We give you thanks tonight. We magnify you, mighty God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So God bless you. Saints of God, thank, thank you again for joining us in Bible study one more time. And we look forward for us continuing on this next week, Wednesday, same place, same time, God's willing. God bless you. See you in church on Sunday in the name of the Lord Jesus. Praise God.